welcome to the Jed Breaks Bread podcast. My name is Jonathan Edwards, and I serve as a pastor at the Grace Brethren Chapel located in Northwest Ohio. The goal of this podcast is to teach God's truth and how to apply it accurately to one's life so that our orthopraxy might be as good as our orthodoxy. May you be blessed as you contemplate God's word. Greetings, saints and fellow bond slaves of Jesus Christ. Today is October 13th, 2023, and I'm going to be sharing with you today my perspective on the present conflict that is happening between Hamas, a terrorist organization located in Palestine, and the nation of Israel. Now, I want to get something clear right off the bat that this perspective that I'm sharing is, is my own perspective. This is not necessarily representative of the church that I pastor. It's not even necessarily representative of the views that my fellow pastors hold. These are the thoughts that have been um, circulating in my mind and that I've been meditating on over the past six days as this conflict has basically continued to escalate. And so um, I guess what I want to do, my my goal in this, is to offer a, a Christian perspective based on some biblical truths and principles. I've seen a lot of perspective on Twitter. I've heard a lot of perspective on different talk shows, a lot of perspective um, regarding how Christians should think, Uh, lots of calls for Christians to just blanketly pray for Israel. But what what are we praying for? What are we praying about? Um, A lot of Christians calling for support for Israel, um, which you know, what does, that, what does that mean? What does that look like? And, and why would we be supporting them as opposed to somebody else? So uh, these are just a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the things or, or the conversation topics that have been going on in the world and in the Christian world. And I guess I want to try to weigh in on some of those things and help you think through those things from a biblical perspective. And because of that, I'm not going to be... <laughs> I'm not going to be using polemic arguments. I'm not going to be um, trying to uh, castigate one side as only evil and the other side as totally righteous. Um, I think that we need to have a, from a Christian perspective, we need to have a really balanced understanding of what's going on, okay? So let's just begin with some of the history, all right? Let's begin with some of the history. Where who are the Palestinians? Where did they come from? All right. If you've watched any news media over the last week, I'm sure that you have seen the map where in uh, like 1920s or maybe the late 1800s, it starts in the late 1800s, it shows that the Palestinian region uh, covered a large segment of what is modern day Israel and it's in green. And then over the next like 10 decades, so over the next 100 years, it shows the green area occupied by Palestine getting progressively smaller so that now it's only like the Gaza Strip and the West Bank that is occupied by the Palestinians. All right, so people are using that map to show that the Israelites are the ones who have been taking over the Palestinian land, that Israel, the Israelites are really the foreign occupying force and so forth and so on, okay? This is the argument that they're making. The problem is that argument doesn't go back far enough historically. Okay, historically, the Palestinians are an Arab ethno-national group. Okay, they are culturally and and linguistically Arabs. Okay, and so they share that in common with many of the other Arab nations that surround Israel. Nations such as Lebanon, uh, some northern Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Iran, uh, a lot of that region, okay, Jordan, um, a lot of that region is populated by Arabs. And where did the Arab people come from? Okay, so this is a a really important question to understand in the conflict. Where did the Arab people come from? Well, if, if we actually look to the scriptures, we can see in the scriptures that the Arab people came from Abraham. Abraham is a common father to both the Arabs and to the Jews. 
So in Genesis chapter 16, we find out that uh, Sarah, or I'm sorry, Sarai, her name had not been changed at this point. Sarai was Abram's wife, and she was frustrated that she had not had a child. So her solution to that problem was to say to her husband, Abram, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. So Sarai had a maid whose name was Hagar. She was an Egyptian, okay? And she uh, was a servant to Sarai, and Abraham went into her and conceived a child, and guess what? That child was named Ishmael, and Ishmael became the father of all the Arab peoples, okay? Now, here's the prophecy that God said about Ishmael in Genesis chapter 16, verses 11 and 12. The angel of the Lord said to her further, this is talking to uh, Hagar, Behold, you are with child, and you will bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him, and he will live to the east of all of his brothers. Now, this is a prophecy bound up in the birth of this child. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. What, what, what are the Arabs known for today? In, in general, what are the Arabs known for? They are known for being in conflict with everyone. Why is that? Why are they known for being in conflict with everyone? Well, they are known for this because it is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. It is a fulfillment of the very Word of God. Now, in, in times past and centuries past, so if we're going to stay within the Old Testament framework, uh, the, the Arab peoples uh, worshipped a multitude of gods. There were a number of different uh, religious structures and organizations that they followed, uh, but, they, but they, by and large, they were always in conflict with Israel, the people of God. Now, moving forward, okay, move forward a few hundred years, and you find out that there was a, a prominent Arab who was said to be a prophet of the god Allah, and his name was Muhammad. This man wrote a book that became known as the Quran, and you have to forgive me, I'm not um, super, super sharp on all of my Islamic slash Muslim history, but I'm going to do my best to give you a little cliff notes. And it was in the, you know, 600s, 500s AD that Muhammad uh, began writing, and he wrote this religious work, and many of the Arabs believed in that religious work and started to practice and follow that religious work. And it became known as the religion of Islam, the religion of, and they became known as Muslims. Now, what you need to understand, okay, is that Within the religion of Islam, within the Muslim community, there are fundamentalist Muslims who take the writings of the Quran and interpret them literally and try to practice them literally. And there are also moderate Muslims who practice the religion but leave out some of the maybe more um, dangerous or detestable practices of the Islamic religion. So maybe they wouldn't be totally in favor of jihad or holy war. But as far as the other religious observances go, they practice those. And then there are also what I would call progressive Muslims who are Muslim because of tradition, Muslim because of where they live, but really they think like a secularist and they're more interested in uh, secular ideas and ideals than in religious fanaticism and religious um, purity, all right? That's probably the best way to put it. Okay, so, so that's the history of where the, the Palestinian people came from, the Arab people. Now, recognize this. If Abraham was the father of the Arab people, let's ask ourselves a question. Who else was Abraham the father of? He was the father of the Jews. Abraham's son that was born according to the promise is Isaac, and Isaac's descendants are known as the Jewish people. And what did the Jewish people receive? The Jewish people received the law, the law of Moses, 
They call it the Torah. They also have other <clears throat> rabbinic writings that they hold to be very sacrosanct, and uh, they and amongst the Jews, you also have those who are fundamentalists. You have those who are moderates, and that you have those that are progressive. Okay, and the same distinctions would apply. The fundamentalist Jews, I think. If, if I'm accurate, would be known as the Zionists. And they are trying to reinstitute the Israel that God promised according to the text in the Old Testament. So they believe it's their mandate to regain the lands, the lands of Canaan that God promised. So what do you notice then about these two people groups? They're technically half-brothers. They come from the same man, uh, Abram, Abraham, but they have radically different worldviews about who God is, and they have um, a very similar perspective on what to do towards the other. So the, the Arabs believe that they should be exterminating the Jews, and the Jews, who are fundamentalists, believe that they have every right to exterminate the Arabs. And both would say that they're acting according to God's will. So you, you have to understand that in this conflict— there is a religious worldview that is the foundation for how they are acting towards one another. And when you have a religious worldview that serves as the foundation for why you are treating this other person or this other party the way that you are, you don't just change that worldview overnight. You don't just negotiate peace with that worldview. That worldview will continue even if a peace a temporary peace is negotiated. So whether this is the um, fifth conflict or the final conflict that will happen between Israel and Hamas, we don't know how this is going to turn out. You can say this, if peace is negotiated, there will still be a lingering hatred, there will still be a lingering desire by some in each camp to eradicate and to destroy the others. The conflict between Hamas and Israel is a worldview conflict based upon their religion, okay? It is a worldview conflict based upon their religion. Now, how do Christians fit into this? Well, Christians recognize that the God we serve, Jesus, is the same God that Abraham served, Yahweh, all right? We believe Jesus and Yahweh are the same God, they're the same, you know, Jesus is the second member of the triune God. Yahweh, all right, refers at sometimes in the Old Testament to Jesus himself, the second member, and sometimes it refers to the Father. God's name, Yahweh, means I am who I am. Jesus says he is the eternal, preexistent, incarnate God. He is both the creator and savior of the world to those who would put their faith in him. Now, do you know what? Both the Jews and the Muslims would be hostile to the Christian perspective. If they both had the opportunity, the fundamentalist Jews and the fundamentalist Muslims would kill Christians. And I think that you'll see this happen you do see it happen in some of the countries that are dominated by the Islamic religion. We need to understand as Christians today that the Israel that exists presently is, yes, they are God's people. Yes, God has a relationship with them, but God has suspended his program with them at the present time. And I'm saying this speaking from a dispensational point of view. And I recognize that there are many Christians out there who don't share a dispensational perspective on the truth, but I believe that if you're really thoughtful and you really look at Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3 and Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11, you can see that God operates in different, dispen- uh, in different ways according to different dispensations. And this is not wrong for God to do this. God is sovereign. He can operate how he wants to. I believe 
that Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, spells out God's program for Israel, and there is a parenthesis between the 69th week of Daniel and the 70th week of Daniel, and in that gap of time, that parenthesis of time, is what's known as the church age. And if we go to Romans chapter 11, we can see that God has presently suspended his program with national Israel. This doesn't mean that God doesn't care about Israel. It doesn't mean that God is not planning to do something for Israel in the future. What it does mean is that Israel's actions presently, their actions presently, are not in accordance with the will of God at the present time. Okay? Israel's actions to destroy and to annihilate their enemies are not in accordance with God's plan for Israel at the present time. Now, Israel, okay, so the Zionists who would be looking at the Old Testament would be looking at passages uh, in the Old Testament that talk about the importance of killing all the Canaanites, of not sparing even the women or the children. And they would be saying, this is our mandate from God. And I'm saying to you, that was Israel's mandate in the Old Testament. That's not the present mandate from God. The present mandate from God comes from Jesus Christ, and that is, in Matthew 28, 16 through 20, to preach the gospel, okay, to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded. That's the plan and the program for the present age. That is the church, okay? So let's make sure we understand that when we look at the history, we can see that the Palestinians and the Hamas terrorists who are controlling Palestine and the Israelites and the Zionist leaders who are kind of um, controlling the actions of Israel, both of them have religious worldviews which hate the other and view the other as the enemy— And those religious worldviews have little to do with what's actually being taught in the scriptures according to um, the church age, okay? Both groups need the gospel. The Jews need the gospel just as much as the Arabs or the Muslims need the gospel. They would both be hostile to Christians for telling them that truth. So we need to recognize that as Christians, okay? So that's a little bit of the history. That that helps to frame our discussion on how to think about this particular conflict, okay? So now I want to actually give you some, some points to think about regarding this conflict, okay? The first point is this. In Romans chapter 13, God has given sovereign nations the right to bear the sword in order to maintain peace. God gives sovereign nations the right to bear the sword in order to maintain peace. So where does this idea come from, that there are sovereign nations and that they have the right to bear the sword? Well, the foundations for human government, I believe, are found in Genesis chapter 1, in the dominion that God has given mankind to rule over the earth. And uh, if you check out some of my other episodes that I'm working through right now, The Christian's Relationship to Culture, I'm building the case for not only human government, but the Christian's relationship to human government and the culture, okay? So in Genesis chapter 1, God gives mankind dominion to rule over the earth. Now, One man cannot rule the entire earth. People spread out and multiply and fill the earth, and the the general consequence of that is that people will group themselves into smaller groups and regions, and in that area, they will have to exercise dominion. All right? Now, moving forward to Genesis chapter 9. We see in Genesis chapter 9 a mandate by God to man. Man is not only supposed to... um, exercise dominion over the earth, but in relationship to other men, God says this, Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by his blood 
uh, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. Let me read that again. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. This is a mandate from God to protect the image of God by executing those who are murderers. All right, and this is the first instance where God has given mankind the authority to basically bear the sword in order to protect the image of God. And when we go forward to Romans chapter 13, all right, Romans chapter 13, we see this. Paul writes, Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. These are obviously human governing authorities. There is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So who has established the sovereign nations of the world? It is God himself. It is the will of God that there is a Palestine. It is the will of God that there is a Jordan. It is the will of God that there is a Syria. It is the will of God that there is an Israel. God establishes sovereign nations. Okay? Now, um, listen to what he says in verse 3. For rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same, for it is a minister of God to you for good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. So sovereign nations have a responsibility to bear the sword in order to combat evil. And what happened about six days ago? Hamas, the terrorist organization, launched a rocket attack against Israel and murdered hundreds of Israeli people. That is an act of evil. We cannot escape that fact. There is no justification for that. It is an act of evil. And what then does God say is the response of a sovereign nation, a government, who sees an act of evil committed against its people? They have the authority to bear the sword. And so the response of Israel against Hamas is biblically allowable, because God gives sovereign nations the right to bear the sword in order to maintain peace. If Israel did not bear the sword, if Israel did not respond, It would only embolden the Hamas terrorists and the people of Palestine to continue to commit evil acts against Israel. And so it is difficult for us to wrap our minds around the fact that God gives sovereign nations the opportunity and the responsibility to protect their citizens by bearing the sword against evil. We live in a culture where uh, everybody is a victim and no crime is punished. And uh, we just need to let everybody do whatever makes them feel good in order to kind of allow uh, peace to occur. And uh, the effects of this in our own culture in the United States is terrible. There is rampant lawlessness in our major cities. There is becoming greater lawlessness in our mid-sized cities and even in our small towns because people do not fear the sword of the government. In fact, the sword of many local governments has been totally cut off. Local governments have no authority to punish criminals, and therefore criminals are emboldened. So I would say, first of all, that as a Christian, I believe that Israel's response as a sovereign nation is a just response. Now, in saying that, I recognize that there are going to be many casualties and many tragedies on both sides. And so we need to recognize, number two, that in war, Women and children always suffer. This has been one of the major talking points that's come out this week, with Jewish media sources showing images of women and children who have been beaten, raped, and murdered by Hamas terrorists, and the Hamas terrorists showing images of children and women who have been... um, injured in the counterattacks against Hamas, okay? That's probably the best way to put it. And I think there, there is a difference here, okay? There is a difference in that Hamas is actually targeting women and children. I don't think that Israel, the Zionists, want to target the women or children. That's my, that's my view of the situation. 
And one of the things that I think helps to confirm that is the fact that uh, over the past 24 hours, the nation of Israel dropped a number of flyers uh, over the territory of Gaza and basically said, hey, look, if, if you're a woman or a child or an innocent citizen, you need to get out. You have 24 hours to evacuate before we take a strong military action against Hamas. They're at least giving the women and children an opportunity to escape. That being said, there's probably going to be a lot more women and children who are casualties of this conflict. That's just the reality of it. That doesn't make it acceptable that there are women and children who are the casualties. It doesn't make us feel any better, but this is the reality that we face in a sin-cursed world. This is the reality that we face in war. Women and children always suffer. I want to read to you from uh, a, a conversation that Elisha, the prophet, had with one of the future kings of the nation of Aram in 2 Kings chapter 8. All right, listen to this from 2 Kings chapter 8, beginning in verse 7. Then Elisha came to Damascus. Now Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, was sick, and it was told to him, saying, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazael, who was his assistant, okay, Take a present in your hand and go meet the man of God and inquire of Yahweh by him, saying, Will I be restored to life from the sickness? So Hazael went to meet him and took a present in his hand, even every kind of good thing to Damascus, forty camels loads, and he came and stood before Elisha and said, Your son Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to you, saying, Will I be restored to life from the sickness? Then Elisha said to him, Go, say to him, You will surely be restored to life, but Yahweh has shown me that you will surely die. And he fixed his gaze steadily upon Hazael until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Then Hazael said, Why does my Lord weep? Then he said, Because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. Their fortifications you will set on fire, and their young men you will kill with their sword, and their infants you will dash in pieces, and their pregnant women you will rip up. That's what Elisha says Hazael would do. And you know what? Warfare hasn't changed in centuries. This is still what happens. Young men die. Women and children are murdered and killed as casualties of war. And so we we have to be honest and recognize that in war, women and children always suffer, and both sides, both sides will take actions that result in the death of women and children. Now, we can understand and we can be reasonable and say that Hamas is specifically targeting women and children, whereas Israel is giving them a chance to flee. I will grant you that there is a distinction there. I will grant that there is a distinction. They're, they are not morally equivalent in how they treat women and children. The reality, though, is that in war, women and children will suffer. And so we should expect it on both sides. Now, thirdly, a third thing that we should think about as Christians. I already mentioned once that I'm a dispensational, uh, I have a dispensational perspective on how I interpret the scriptures. We need to understand that what's going on in Israel right now may or may not be what leads into the quote unquote end times, all right? There will be wars and rumors of wars, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 6. There will be conflicts between Israel and the nations. And so we cannot assume as Christians that this is the quote-unquote final conflict. I mean, let's be honest. If you go and look at the history of Israel since their inauguration as a state in 1948, Israel has been involved and I would say at least six major wars with their Arab neighbors over the last 60 years or 70 years. That's part and parcel of life in this region. It's part and parcel of life in almost every region on the earth. Why? Because mankind are sinners. Mankind have 
a desire for more things. They, they have lust, they have greed, they have um, desires to see themselves grow in power or their nations grow in power and to see others put low. And, and so we shouldn't be surprised that these wars take place. We need to be mindful that we are presently in the church dispensation. Therefore, when we look at different prophecies that concern Israel and the end times, we have to say, is this prophecy spoken during the church age, or is it spoken after the church has been removed from the earth? Okay, So the church is going to be translated to heaven in an event that many call the rapture. I'm not sure that that's the best word for it, but that's how it's commonly known. The rapture, which will uh, be... Jesus Christ coming in the clouds to collect his bride, that is the church, and those who are dead in Christ will rise first, and those who are alive at that time will be translated to heaven. And all of the church from the time of Christ's death, uh, from Acts chapter 2 to the time that Christ returns, they will all be translated to heaven. Then, and only then, will God initiate the 70th week of Daniel which is known as the Great Tribulation. It is the 70th week is going to be a seven-year period, and it will be marked by the rise of the Antichrist, who will be the individual who is able to negotiate a peace treaty between Israel and the enemies of Israel. At this time, I don't know that the world is against Israel enough for it to make sense for the Antichrist to arise. It seems to me in my 38 years of life that there is less support for the nation of Israel now than there has ever been during the time that I've been alive. But that still means that there's a lot of support for Israel. There's a lot of support for Israel. And there's not as much support for Hamas. Um, Therefore, let's be real frank, it doesn't seem like the time is quite yet. It could be, maybe we're wrong, it could be next week, But it could be another 20 to 40 or even 100 years from now that the time is right for the nation of Israel to be in conflict with the entire world and the church to be taken out and the Antichrist to come and negotiate that peace treaty. So let's just be really careful about newspaper headline prophecies. I I use newspaper. I mean, who even reads the newspaper anymore? Internet media site headline prophecies. There we go. Okay. Be really careful about that. There are not a a bunch of prophecies that are being fulfilled today. All right. It's not like every day we're, we're turning on the news and seeing all these prophecies from the Old Testament being fulfilled. There's the next great thing is going to be the translation of the church from earth to heaven. And the next thing after that is going to be the revealing of the Antichrist. Prior to this, there's going to be many wars and rumors of wars. So let's not get ahead of God in our diagnosis and our identification of biblical prophecy. A fourth thing that Christians should consider, and I know this is getting a little bit long, but I I trust that you'll be blessed by these, these action points. Christians have a responsibility to take the gospel to both the Arabs and the Jews. I already mentioned that the Muslims and the Jews hate Christians equally. Why? Jews hate us because we believe Jesus was the Messiah, and they do not believe Jesus was the Messiah. Arabs hate us, or Muslims hate us, because we believe Jesus is the Messiah, and he is the only way to God, and that Allah is not God. So, if we are going to pray as Christians, we should pray for opportunities to take the gospel to both of these people groups. We should pray that peace comes not through negotiation, but through hearts that are transformed by the power of the gospel and in obedience to Jesus Christ. We should pray and we should consider what we can do to help bring about the knowledge of Jesus to these lost people groups. And you know what? There's there's as many uh, there's a lot of Palestinians in the United States. There's a lot of people who are uh, Muslims in the United States. There are a lot of people who are Jews in the United States. 
and they need the gospel, and we have access to them here. I, I, I doubt that there's very many people who have access to the Muslims and the Jews who are in the Middle East right now. That's a very difficult place to be in. It's a very difficult place to go and share the gospel. But we have a mandate. Our responsibility is to make disciples, and so that's what we need to be about. Finally, it's not necessarily wrong to pray for a blanket peace in this area, okay? We should, in general, be people who are peace-loving. But what we need to understand is that praying for blanket peace doesn't really address the issues that I've already set forth in the podcast. Playing, praying for br- bl- blanket peace doesn't uh, change anybody's worldview. It doesn't change anybody's religion. It's not necessarily wrong, but a prayer for blanket peace is kind of a short-sighted prayer because it doesn't address any of the issues that I've already mentioned in this particular podcast. It doesn't look at the issue or the conflict with an eye towards theology. Praying for blanket peace, um, you know, it's not wrong to pray for peace. In fact, in in First Timothy chapter two, Paul says that we should ask the Lord for rulers who will promote peace. Why? So that we can live tranquil and quiet lives and go about the business of promoting the gospel. So it's not wrong to do that. It's just short sighted. It's it's kind of incomplete. Okay, so if if you want to pray for peace, pray for peace, but recognize all of these other truths are still happening, and that prayer for peace is not changing worldviews. We need to pray for transformed hearts through the preaching of the gospel, through the message of the cross of Calvary. And Jews need that message as much as Arabs need that message. All right, so if you're a Christian listening to this, and you're thinking, wow, what, what, do, I, what do I do? I mean, well, I think you can pray. I think you should pray specifically about this particular conflict. I think that you should be very careful as a Christian in taking sides uh, of nationalities, okay? We, as Christians, are, well, if you're living in the United States, you are a, a member of the United States. I think you should be very careful about just offering your blanket support to Israel no matter what. I think a carefully measured support is okay. Because, again, Israel is a sovereign nation. They have a right to defend themselves. They have a right to uh, bear the sword in order to prevent evil. But we need to be conscientious that we're not just um, giving Israel a blank check to act however they want to because of this conflict. Christians need to be mindful of that, okay? I, I just think that we as Christians need to not get caught up in the geopolitics of this particular conflict, and we need to remember that God has called us to serve in the local church and to be focused on the ministries that we have in the local church. We have a task to do regardless of whether the nations are warring or not, and let us be uh, diligent to be about our task. Me as a shepherd you as a sheep, maybe you're a fellow pastor, a brother pastor, you need to be about the business of being a shepherd. Let's do what we can to honor the nation of Israel, to respect them, but also to give some kind of dignity to the people of Hamas as well and to the Palestinians. They're also people who are made in the image of God and they need a savior. They're not second-class citizens on the world stage. They're not subhuman. We shouldn't treat them like that. We shouldn't. It's not right. We need to give them the dignity that they deserve while also condemning their heinous crimes against the innocent. All right, well, I'm kind of starting to ramble a little bit. I'll let you guys go. Thank you for listening to this. And once again, this is just my perspective. And as this conflict grows and develops, I I may change some aspects of this. I may, new information might come out that might make me feel differently or think differently about this particular situation. So I, I, want to, I want to be biblical in my thinking, and I want to encourage you to also be biblical as well. God bless you. May you be more fervent in your studies of the Word, and may you be diligent to obey all that Christ has commanded. <laughs>